Hello everyone. Tonight, we are seated in a lost temple in the heart of a forest and everything is quiet around us. Only the sound of an ancient fountain with its water lilies breaks the silence just a little bit as the sun slowly sets. This is the right time to gather round and listen to some stories. The first one begins long, long ago, when the world did not exist and there was only darkness. The darkness you can picture if you gently close your eyes and let yourself go. Here's a story about how the world was created. Before time began to exist, the world was just an endless, dark ocean. And the only sound that existed at the time was the sound of its waves. But no one could hear them, because there were no earth, no heaven, not even time. Only two beings existed and were asleep. There was a giant serpent, a cobra, that floated on the waters, and Vishnu, the lord of creation, who was lying asleep, safe in the cobra's coils. Vishnu had been asleep forever, even though forever made no sense in a world without time. In this world, there was nothing to know, nothing to explore, nothing to wait for. But the deep sleep of Vishnu contained a promise of change, a possibility that one day something could start and replace the nothingness. This promise began to materialize. Slowly, the first sound that had ever existed, apart from the waves of the dark ocean, the first sound started. Hum. This sound had the power to fill the emptiness. It throbbed with energy and it progressively conquered this void without limit that had always been the fabric of the universe. As the emptiness vanished and energy filled the world, the sound intensified. It became so loud that the waves of the dark ocean rose higher and higher until it became deafening and chaos replaced this quietness that had always existed. The agitation and the loud sound woke up Vishnu. He opened his eyes and became conscious of the world and of existence. As he was awakening, a lotus flower grew from his belly button the first flower that had ever existed. The flower opened, and right in its middle sat another being, a new one, Brahma. Vishnu told Brahma to set to work and create a world. Still sitting in the flower, Brahma calmed the wind with a glance of his eyes and the deafening sound, Om, that had awakened the world, finally receded. Peace succeeded to chaos. Then, Brahma split the lotus flower into three different parts. With one, he made the earth. With the second one, he made the sky. And with the last one, he made the heavens. 
the earth was bare. And so, following Vishnu's instructions, Brahma created more things to cover it. Grass, flowers, trees, and all the other plants. To populate it, he created living beings and let them evolve so that the earth became full of animals, birds, fish, that lived in all sorts of different environments. This is the world we were born into, that started eons ago, when the sound Om filled the void and woke up Vishnu. This was only one of many different creation stories in the Hindu tradition. Some are connected to it and include variations. Others are completely unrelated. For example, in another creation story, life came from the cracking of an enormous primordial egg from which all the life in the universe was born. In other stories that also involve Brahma, he didn't start creating the world following Vishnu's instructions. He existed alone, and out of loneliness, split himself into two parts to create a male and a female that were the ancestors of all beings. Yet in other Hindu texts, it is said that nobody can know how the universe came into existence. Maybe even the gods cannot know. Or an explanation that sounds almost scientific is provided. There would be a single source of everything, from which primary elements came, and their combinations and recombinations, determined by the laws of nature, would have led to the universe as it is. We will go on with another story in a minute, but this gives us an example of the extraordinary variety of traditions and myths in Hinduism. This religion has hundreds of millions of followers. It is the third biggest in the world by number of practitioners. It has a long and tumultuous history that we will also explore later. Very ancient roots that can be traced to the Vedas, Indian texts from the second millennium BC. And after so many centuries of evolution, different traditions, practices and beliefs abound under the general term of Hinduism. This religious and mythological continent is generally little known in non-Hinduist regions. We see or hear of some figures, like Ganesha, the elephant god. We know names like Vishnu, Shiva, Brahma, Krishna, Kali. But these are just the tips of an immense iceberg that we will explore a little bit tonight, together with stories that feature gods, heroes and wonders. It is all going to be easy to follow, and we will take things one by one. Just let me do the work. As always, in the first comment pinned under this video, you have timestamps, Links to all your streaming services like Spotify or Apple Music if you prefer to listen to my stories there and a link to Patreon where your support is always very much appreciated and helps keep this channel free of video ads. It also gives you access to downloads, podcasts and updates about what I'm working on. Before we dive into the origins of Hinduism, its pantheon 
and principles, let's discover one of the most extraordinary epic ever written, the story of Prince Rama, also known as the Ramayana. Make yourself comfortable because this one is long. Once upon a time, a king, Dasharatha, reigned over a kingdom called Ayodhya. The king was respected, his kingdom was prosperous, and he had three beautiful wives. The only thing lacking to his happiness was a son. None of his wives had had one, only girls and Dasharatha needed an heir. So he turned to the gods. He performed a fire sacrifice and asked for a male heir. His prayers were answered beyond his greatest hopes. Vishnu, one of the most powerful gods that many regarded even as the supreme being, had heard the plea and decided to act in the king's favor. He gave him not one, but four sons. All three wives became pregnant, and one of them had twins. The first son to be born was Rama, and soon followed his three brothers, Bharata, and the twins Lakshmana and Shatrigna. What the king ignored was that each son had been endowed with the essence of God Vishnu. They were part of a plan. The gods were oppressed by a powerful demon, Ravana. But despite their powers, they could not act directly. Because only a mortal could destroy Ravana. And so Vishnu had opted to be born into mortality, so that he would be able to combat the demon. The mortals ignored this plan for now, and it is with joy and gratefulness that King Dasharatha received his four sons. The boys were all reared as the princes of the realm and received the education that was suitable to their rank. They learned the scriptures to be cultured and wise, and the art of war to also become strong warriors. Sixteen years passed, and all princes grew in strength and beauty. When Rama was sixteen, a sage visited the court of his father in search of help against demons that disturbed the rights and oppressed the population of his village. Rama and his brother Lakshmana accepted to help him, and they received instructions and supernatural weapons from the man. Thanks to these, they could destroy the demons, and with this fight, Young Prince Rama showed the extraordinary strength and courage he possessed, which made his father proud and happy since he was thinking of crowning him as his successor. As these events happened in the kingdom of Ayodhya, a young girl, a princess, was approaching adulthood in a neighboring kingdom, Mithila, her name was Sita, and she also had extraordinary origins. One day, when she was a baby, she had been found by the king in a field. As he was digging a deep furrow with his plow, because he liked to work himself on his land, the child had unexplainably appeared in the furrow. The king immediately regarded this baby as a divine gift and adopted her, even though he already had three other daughters. She was named Sita, the Sanskrit word for furrow. Sita grew up 
to be a girl of extraordinary beauty and charm. And of course, as a princess, there would be no shortage of pretenders to marry her when she would be of age. Because he wanted an extraordinary man for his daughter, the king decided that in order to marry his daughter, it would be compulsory to prove one's worth by lifting and wielding a very heavy bow that his ancestors had been gifted by the great god Shiva. The bow was enchanted, and this would guarantee that only the right husband for Sita would be able to lift and wield it. After Rama and his brother Lakshmana had killed the demons they had been sent to fight, the sage that had requested their help took them to the kingdom of Mithila, where Sita lived, to show them the extraordinary bow that Shiva himself had presented to the ancestors of the king. When he saw the bow, Rama expressed his desire to lift it, and he did. He was not only able to lift it, but when he wielded it, he drew the string with so much strength that the string broke. This was without a doubt a sign that Rama was the one destined to marry Sita, and a marriage was arranged. Not only one, but four. The four sons of the kingdom of Ayodhya would marry the four daughters of the kingdom of Mithila, Sita and her three sisters. The weddings were celebrated with great festivity in Mithila, and the four married princes with their wives returned to Ayodhya. Rama and Sita had fallen in love. Not just like two young people can love each other for a while, but deeper, as if their connection had something predestined, as if their couple had long been written in the Book of Destiny. And so they had quickly become entirely devoted to each other. Their new love would soon be tested, however. When they returned to Ayodhya, the now old king had decided to crown Rama and make him his successor on the throne officially. It was the king's prerogative to choose his successor, and so nothing remained between Prince Rama and the crown, or so it seemed. King Dasharetha had three wives, the three mothers of his sons. Initially they all agreed to let Rama become the new king, but the second wife had uh, second thoughts on the morning of the coronation day. She was inspired by uh, a wicked maidservant to not let the throne escape when she had a son, Bharata, one of Rama's brothers, who could also become king. And she had a card to play. The king owed her two favors, two boons, that he had granted her long ago, but that she had never claimed. She decided to act just before Rama was crowned. She went to see the king and claimed her boons. First, she wanted Rama to be exiled into the wilderness for fourteen years, and second, she wanted her son, Bharata, to become the king. The old king was heartbroken, but he was constrained by his devotion to his given word. He would not deny her the claims, because he had promised, and she was in her right. And so he called for Rama, and told his favorite son that even though he lamented it, he had decided to exile him for fourteen years. 
Many men his age would have reacted with anger and tried to make the king change his mind. But Rama was always in control of his behavior and obedient, and so he accepted his father's decree and prepared to leave. Sita had decided to accompany him wherever he would go, and at first he tried to convince her to stay in Ayodhya. There would be dangers, none of the luxury a princess was used to. Life would be harsh in exile, and maybe wild beasts or starvation would kill them. But Sita argued that the only kingdom where she wanted to live was with him, and he accepted. At least he would leave Ayodhya with the only treasure he really cherished. His other brother, Lakshmana, who had slayed the demons with him, also insisted to accompany them. And so the three left the palace and walked for a long time. They walked until they passed the frontier of Ayodhya, and they set camp in a forest. The old king was so sad and desperate to see Rama leave for a long exile with no hope of seeing him again, that he could not bear the grief, and passed away in the following days. Ayodhya was left without a king, because all these events had taken place in the absence of Bharata, the son propelled to the head of the kingdom by his mother's scheming. He was on a journey to visit a relative, and when he came back home, he learned that his father was dead, and two of his beloved brothers and sister-in-law were in exile. So he refused to profit from his mother's wicked machinations, and instead went to see Rama in the forest to ask him to return and rule the kingdom. But Rama was determined to respect his dead father's decree, and since his father was no longer there to overturn his decision, he declared that he would not return before the end of the period of exile. Decisions had been taken, and so Rama, his wife Sita, and his brother Lakshmana would leave off the land and stay away of their kingdom for fourteen long years. They traveled southward and built houses, small cottages near a river, where they could live a simple life, hunting and gathering food, and waiting for the fourteen years to expire. But there, one day, they received a visit. A woman, extraordinarily attractive and with magnificent clothes, arrived where they lived, and as the laws of hospitality commanded, they offered her to share a meal with them. They were surprised to receive such a visit and even more when the woman tried to seduce each of the brothers, without success. Angered by this failure, the woman revealed her true nature. She was a Rakshasi, a malevolent female demon. And even worse, she was also the sister of Ravana, this powerful demon that threatened the gods and that Vishnu had resolved to take human incarnation to be able to combat. The threads of destiny had joined the path of Ravana's sister with Rama, that Vishnu had endowed with his essence when he was born. Full of rage, the demon attacked Sita and tried to kill her, 
but Lakshmana could stop her. He was almost as strong as his brother Rama. And to mark the defeated demon, he cut her nose and ears. Apart from Ravana, she had two other brothers, and when they learned what had happened to their sister, they tried to retaliate. They went to the place where the trio lived. But Rama vanquished them. The three had resisted and were safe for now. But the incident would, without a doubt, attract Ravana's attention. When Ravana heard of these events, he resolved to destroy Rama, ignoring that the exiled prince carried the essence of Vishnu himself and was no mere mortal. But Ravana knew that only a very powerful warrior could have defeated his sister and brothers, and the demon liked to scheme. So he devised a plan. He asked for the help of another Rakshasa, whom he ordered to take the form of a golden deer and captivate Sita's attention. If Sita followed the golden deer, she would be separated from Rama and they would be able to capture her without risk. When the deer appeared, near the houses where the trio lived, Rama immediately suspected a trap. The essence of Vishnu inside him gave him the power to see that the deer was a demon in disguise. But Sita could not see it, and she was entranced by the beauty of the deer. When Rama announced he would chase the deer, she asked him not to kill it, but capture it. And Rama accepted, on the condition that she would stay inside the house and under the protection of Lakshmana. She could absolutely not go out. After which he began chasing the deer in the forest with his wife under his brother's guard. After some time, Sita heard Rama call out to her, and she was afraid for his life. In fact, it was not Rama who was calling, but the demon Ravana, using his powers to attract her outside. Lakshmana refused to let her go out, arguing that Rama could perfectly defend himself and that they had to follow his orders. But she was terrified for Rama, and insisted that it was not she, but her husband, that needed help. She promised to stay inside the house, and not entertain any stranger for as long as he would be away. And so, reluctantly, Lakshmana accepted to go help Rama, Ravana's plan had worked. Sita was now alone. The demon took the appearance of an ascetic, old and frail, and walked to the house to request hospitality. Sita was suspicious at first of any stranger, and she had not forgotten to keep the door closed. But what could an old and skinny man do to her? It looked like she was stronger than him. And she accepted to open the door and let him in. Immediately, Ravana retook his shape. That of a very tall and powerful man, with a horrible face. He captured her and took her away heading south to his domain on the island of Lanka, to the very south of India. When he reached his palace with his captive, he put Sita under the guard of several female demons of Rakshasis, 
and celebrated his revenge on Rama. He had stolen the most precious, the most treasured being Rama had in his life. Ravana had noted the extraordinary beauty of Sita, a beauty so perfect that he had never seen one like this among humans and he asked Sita to marry him. But of course Sita refused, and swore she would rather die than be unfaithful to Rama. During these events, Rama and Lakshmana had returned to their houses and discovered that Sita had been abducted. The news was devastating, but Rama immediately decided he would free her, whatever the cost and the odds. Ravana reigned over Lanka and had armies of hundreds of demons. His citadel had high and very thick walls and there were only two men. So first they needed allies and so they left the place where they had lived and began a journey to the south. On the way, they started making allies. First there was Shabari, an ascetic woman who embraced Rama's cause and directed them to the land of the Vanaras, forest-dwelling beings who looked like apes and who were in a civil war at the time. They fought over the throne of their kingdom, and among them lived Hanuman, the greatest of their heroes, and also a god who had extraordinary powers. Rama befriended Hanuman, who resolved to help him free Sita. But Rama and Lakshmana needed more allies, an entire army, and so they accepted to help the pretender of the Vanara kingdom to seize the throne against the promise that he would help them later, help them fight Ravana. And so it was done. Rama fought alongside the apes to retake their capital and contributed to give them victory after which he could count on their support. Of all the new friends and allies of Rama, the most powerful and faithful was now Hanuman, the ape hero. Hanuman decided by himself to go on a mission to Langa, to find and free Sita for his friend. So he traveled to the island of Lange, and uh, using his powers, he took a gigantic form to make a colossal leap across the sea to the island. On the way, he also met many challenges that form a secondary epic within the Ramayana. He had to face demons, he encountered a living and intelligent mountain, that offered him rest. He subjugated a female demon to gain access to all of Lanka. He spied on Ravana near his citadel, and he finally managed to infiltrate Ravana's lair and meet Sita inside. She was still under guard and harassed by Ravana, who tried to convince her to marry him. Hanuman reassured Sita that Rama was still alive, showing her a ring that belonged to the prince as proof, and he offered her to accompany him to safety, far from Langa. The offer was very tempting, but Sita thought, and surprisingly refused. She had understood that the fight between Rama and Ravana needed another resolution. The demon had captured her, and Rama carried the essence of Vishnu, and so Ravana was doubly his enemy. 
The demon had captured her when she was under Rama's protection, and so only Rama should now free her and destroy the demon, because such was the meaning of the ordeal they were living. Before Hanuman left, she gave him her calm as proof of life, and the hero, after new adventures, escaped Lanka and returned to Rama. Time had now come for the war between Rama and Ravana to reach a different scale. Rama had an army of humans and apes, powerful warriors with him, including Hanuman and his brother Lakshmana, and Ravana had all the demons of Lanka. The goal would be the liberation of Sita and also the conquest of the kingdom of Lanka. Rama's army crossed to Lanka, and a lengthy war ensued, with multiple fights on the shores, in the forests, and on the mountains of the large island. During a fight, Lakshmana was badly injured, but Hanuman could save him by adopting again a gigantic form and flying all the way north to the Himalayas, where he retrieved herbs that could cure the prince's wounds. Finally, Ravana was killed by Rama, and the demons of Lanka defeated for good. Sita could now be freed, and on a broader scale, Rama had also completed successfully Vishnu's plan, when, many years before, the god had endowed him with his essence, taking a mortal form that allowed him to destroy this demon. The time of exile had also expired, and the couple could return to Ayodhya, where Rama could finally get what was rightfully his, the crown of his kingdom. There would be more events and adventures to keep the kingdom safe, but the reign of Rama would be one of happiness and prosperity for all his subjects. This was only a summary of the Ramayana, because there are many subplots and dozens of named characters. The text also exists in multiple versions, including outside India. There are some from Cambodia, Indonesia, Thailand or Malaysia. Together with another epic, the Mahabharata, with a different storyline that I will also retell for you. The Ramayana is deeply rooted in Hindu traditions. So, what is Hinduism, actually? It is hard to give it a simple definition, because it includes a wide range of philosophies, of beliefs and rites, that appeared very long ago in ancient India. But all the different traditions or denominations share concepts, a cosmology, and they have a lot of sacred texts in common. The founding texts, there were others later, being the Vedas. I told you about the Vedas recently in a story about the origins of Buddhism. The Vedas are a large collection of ancient Indian texts that appeared in the second millennium BC, almost 4,000 years ago. Their authors are unknown, they are not signed, and there were probably many contributors. They are believed by Hindus to have been inspired by gods or by the universe, and to reveal a much more ancient set of truths. However, modern Hinduism has evolved a lot since the antiquity. Scholars consider Hinduism to be the product of a synthesis 
that emerged between the 6th and the 3rd centuries BC, that's still 2500 years ago, about at the same time as the origins of Buddhism. This Hindu synthesis gathered a lot of Indian religious traditions, including Brahmanism, an ancient polytheist religion centered of the cult of Brahma, and also multiple regional Indian traditions and deities. Since there was no single founder or a single doctrine, Hinduism was diverse from the beginning, and this diversity only increased when it went out of India and expanded to Southeast Asia. Its origins also explain why it shares concepts with Buddhism. They are both rooted in ancient India in the first millennium BC. The concepts they share include karma, for example, that is to say, the principle of cause and effect that states that the actions and the intents of an individual will have repercussions in the future. Or samsara, the idea that the world is like a wheel that completes cycles and that living beings are bound to this wheel. They keep coming back as they reincarnate. Currently, there are four main denominations of Hinduism. The largest one, by number of followers, is called Vaishnavism, or sometimes Vishnuism. It is the same thing, because it places the god Vishnu as the supreme being that leads all of the deities. It is far from unified as a denomination. For example, it includes subcurrents that consider as supreme beings historical incarnations, avatars of Vishnu, like Rama, we just talked about him, or Krishna. You probably heard the name Krishna before. He is an avatar, an aspect of Vishnu, and a god in his own right, a god of protection and compassion that is very popular with most Hindus. Because contrary to the image we may have of ancient polytheist religions, we tend to consider all the gods as separate entities with their specific personalities and their field of intervention. But in reality, many polytheist religions actually venerated or venerate different avatars of the same beings. To some followers of Vaishnavism, all gods are different manifestations of Vishnu, and these different faces and names are a way of making the divine more relatable, understandable, approachable. The second denomination of Hinduism is Shaivism, that places the god Shiva as the supreme being. Shiva is present and venerated in all the traditions of Hinduism, with different roles attributed to him that range from a creator god to the god of destruction and a rebirth that will end our world before a new one replaces it. To the followers of Shaivism, he is the most important deity. The third one is Shaktism, that places goddess Shakti, also called Mahadevi, as the primordial goddess. One well-known aspect of Shakti is the goddess of death, of time and change, called Kali who is also present across various denominations of Hinduism, but particularly important in Shaktism. And a fourth significant tradition, but bear in mind that there are others, is 
the smarter tradition or smartism. It takes elements from other denominations, but it is notable for the worship of five main Hindu deities that are strictly treated as equals Shiva, Vishnu, Shakti, Surya, a sun deity, and Ganesha or Ganesh. The image, the appearance attributed to Ganesha is well known. It is the elephant god, and his image is abandoned throughout India because he is popular across denominations as a benevolent figure that removes obstacles in life and brings good luck. So, before I tell you the story of the Mahabharata, here's a mythological story that retells how Ganesha got his elephant head. Ganesha was a son of Shiva and Parvati, the goddess of harmony, love and motherhood. And early on, he proved that he was very astute. One day, there was a competition with his brother to know who could travel around the world faster, and the winner would receive the fruit of knowledge. While his brother went off on a lengthy journey, Ganesha let him go, and then just turned around his parents, the creators and embodiment of the world. And so without effort, he was given the fruit of knowledge, because indeed he had been the first to travel around the world. There are different stories about his birth, and the most well-known one explains how he got his elephant head. One day, the goddess Parvati had started preparing for a bath, but her personal guard was away, and she didn't want to be disturbed by anyone during her bath. So she took some turmeric paste that was usually used for bathing, and with it she made the statue of a boy. She breathed life into the statue, and instructed the little boy to guard the door and not let anyone in until she had finished her bath. As she was making these preparations, her husband, Shiva, had come out of meditation and now wished to meet Parvati. So he went to her apartments, but was halted by the strange boy that guarded the door. Shiva tried to reason with the boy, explaining that he was Parvati's husband. But the boy could only follow the instructions he had been created for, and would not let the god in. Sensing that no reasoning would work, Shiva decided to fight the boy. And in his divine fury, he severed the boy's head, killing him instantly. Parvati was alerted by the noise, so she opened the door, and she was immediately enraged by the destruction of her little turmeric paste boy. So enraged that she decided to destroy all of creation. She could be radical sometimes. At her call, several monsters arose from her body and threatened complete destruction of the world. The creator, Brahma, was alerted that this angry goddess was about to destroy his creation, and so he forced her to reconsider and calm down. She agreed with two conditions. First, that the boy be brought back to life, and second, that he would become a god and be revered by all. 
Shiva also had cooled down and agreed to his wife's conditions. But the boy was now headless and could not sleep without a head. So Shiva asked his devotees to bring the head of the first creature they would find. And they soon returned with the head of a strong and powerful elephant. The head was placed on the body. New life was breathed into it. And this is how Ganesha was born. I told you that together with the Ramayana, another legendary epic of major importance in Hindu mythology was the Mahabharata. The epic is so long and abandoned in characters and subplots that it would be impossible to cover exhaustively. It was written in verses, and to give you an idea, it is seven times as long as the Iliad and the Odyssey combined. It is the most imposing epic from the ancient world that we know of, and it has very ancient origins. Some of the stories it contains were probably transmitted orally for centuries before they were put in writing. The present form of the epic appeared around 480, and it contains a wealth of mythological material with spiritual, moral or political significance. But everything is arranged around the central heroic narrative that tells of the struggle for the control of a kingdom between two groups of cousins, the Kauravas and the Pandavas. The story begins with two brothers, two princes. The oldest of the two, Dhritavashtra, was supposed to become king, but he was blind, and this made him unfit to rule. So, on his father's death, he was passed over in favor of his younger brother, Pandu. Pandu was afflicted by a curse that prevented him from having children, also a problem for a king. So, his wife asked the gods to father children in Pandu's name. And the gods responded, Dharma, Indra and other male gods made Pandu's wives pregnant and several princes, five of them, were born as divine heirs to Pandu. Pandu's blind brother, who had been denied the throne, also had children and two clans formed. With these two groups of cousins, the Kauravas, the sons of the blind prince, Dhritarashtra, and the Pandavas, the sons of Pandu. Even though their biological fathers were different gods. Early on, jealousy and enmity grew between the two clans. And when King Pandu died, an open conflict started. The Kauravas had the upper hand in this fight, and the Pandavas were defeated and exiled. During their exile, the five Pandava princes jointly married a single woman, Draupadi, and they met a cousin of theirs, Krishna. Krishna was an avatar of Vishnu, like Rama, that we talked about before. And before befriending the Pandavas, Krishna had already accomplished extraordinary deeds. He had helped people and overthrown his uncle, who was a tyrant, to reinstate the rightful king of the kingdom he came from. Krishna became a close friend and companion of the five Pandavas. Eventually, they all decided to go back to their kingdom and face the Kauravas for the second time. 
but again they lost. It was decided that everything would be settled in a game of dice against the eldest of the Coravers. But luck was not on their side, and the Pandavas were condemned to exile for twelve years to the forest. For twelve years, the Pandavas lived in the wilderness and prepared their revenge. Carefully collecting allies and building up an army. Finally, they prepared to settle the feud with their cousins by an open war, in the hope that force would be the way of retrieving their kingdom. The armies of the Kauravas and the Pandavas met for a series of great battles on the field of Kurukshetra, in the north of India, close to Delhi. After numerous fights, exploits, and uh, heroic actions on both sides, victory was finally theirs, and all the Kauravas were annihilated, ending their branch of the family. But at a terrible cost, only the five Pandava brothers and Krishna survived. After this great victory, they set out for heaven, now that their fate on earth had been accomplished. And ultimately, and after new adventures, they were reunited with their enemies in heavens to enjoy perpetual bliss, each of the parties having accomplished their destiny. So, this is the main plotline of the Mahabharata, but it doesn't do justice to uh, the abundance of this work. It barely occupies one-fifth of it. The rest are individual stories of the many characters involving gods, demons, and uh, all sorts of fabulous creatures. We are nearing the end of tonight's stories. But before I leave you, here is a last legend, the most famous one about a goddess called Durga. Durga is one of the principal aspects of the primordial goddess Shakti, an aspect under which Shakti turns to a fierce warrior that at the same time confronts enemies and protects children and humanity in general. Her legend centers around combating evils and demonic forces that threaten peace and prosperity. She is also one of the most revered and popular deities in modern Hinduism. One of her famous stories is how she was created to slay Maishasura, a demon. Maishasura was a demon who had the appearance of a half-man, half-buffalo, and who had been captured and punished by Brahma long ago. Brahma had condemned him to severe penance. The demon was to pray, fast, abstain from any violence, and generally correct his behavior and character. Years had passed, and Mahishasura behaved well, strictly following Brahma's instructions. Brahma was pleased by this devotion, and appeared to him, announcing that he would grant him a favor, a boon, as a reward for his good behavior. The demon asked the god for immortality. But even though it would have been in his power, Brahma refused, stating that all must die one day, that demons were not gods, and that the laws of nature could not be violated, including by the one who had created them. Maishasura was disappointed and thought for a while. 
He did not want to lose his credit with Brahma, and he asked for a more modest favor, that only a woman would be able to kill him. He thought all women were weak and uh, no match for his strength. So this power would be the next best thing after immortality, because in practice no one would be able to kill him. Brahma thought that this was acceptable and granted him the favor. Mahishasura became invincible to all males. As soon as he was invested with this new power, the demon stopped pretending he was devoted to Brahma and embraced again his uh, evil nature. He mistreated innocent people, destroyed, and as he gained confidence, he even began to invade the world. He was confident that no man could stop him, and uh, he didn't fear women, since they were powerless against him or so he thought. The devas, the gods, were worried, and they consulted the supreme trinity, Vishnu, Brahma and Shiva. They all combined their powers to create a warrior woman with many arms, one so brave and strong that she would be able to face Mahishasura. They gave her a copy of their own weapons and a lion as a mount. And so Durga was created and became the arm of the gods. Durga reached before Mahishasura's palace on her lion and defied the demon. Laughing, thinking he was invincible, the demon attacked the goddess taking different forms, and the fight lasted for a very long time. Each time Durga was about to triumph, the demon changed form, and the fight restarted. Finally, as Maishasura was shifting again to the form of a buffalo, she managed to hit him during this transformation, which was his weak point. The demon was killed, and the world delivered from his oppression, after which Durga could return triumphant and take her place among the many gods, always ready to intervene to restore peace and order. We have reached the end of our stories for tonight. And you can now fall asleep, listening to the sweet sound of the fountain. Everything is perfectly quiet, and the benevolent gods and heroes will look after your sleep. You can let go, adopt a little smile, and let sleep take you. Sleep well. Sweet dreams. Au revoir.